Good evening. Thanks so much for joining us tonight for Curating the Internet. My name is Jara Patrick, and I'm MN Artists Program Director. For those of you not familiar with us, MN Artists is a project of the Walker Art Center and the McKnight Foundation, and we are home to a dynamic online community, responsive arts journalism, engaging public programs uh, that connect artists and audiences both online and off. So we have the Walker Art Center and the McKnight Foundation to thank for supporting our programming and keeping it free to all. We have the Institute of Museum and Library Services to, for their support for our digital platform. And we'd also like to thank Target for generously supporting late museum hours and programs like these through Target Free Thursday nights. All right, into tonight's program. With cultural circumstances broadening the definition of what it means to curate, the role of the curator, we're gathering here tonight to discuss and to not necessarily even determine what it means to curate digital content. The word curator gets tossed around frequently. Historically, curators have been keepers of cultural institutions. Uh, now industry by industry has grabbed hold of this term. Wedding planners are curators. Ad executives are curators. A chef is a curator. Uh, even newspapers themselves are also curators. It now seems possible to curate anything from a music festival to a cheese plate. Tonight, we'll discuss this act of curating through three provocations. The first is how the notion of curating has changed or evolved within the art world versus the broader cultural sector. The second is with a proliferation of digital tool sets for participation online. How does our access for producing and organizing content in the field, uh, how does that level that playing field for authority? And the third is how we understand our relationship with this premise. How we imagine the web and our participation in the web to continue to evolve. To better engage in this topic, we've gathered a panel of artists, curators, and practitioners. Andy Adams, founder of and editor of Flack Photo. Uh, we have curator of Northern Lights uh, and various other digital projects, Steve Dietz. We have uh, art visual artist and organizer, Paige Gugamis. And we have artist and self-proclaimed projectionista, Mina Mangalvedekar. Together, these curators of new media, platform builders, digital thinkers and users will discuss the current landscape of curating and how the web has impacted curation and collection, experts and aficionados, and taste making and hierarchies with regard to art and culture, all in the democratic and public domain of the internet. All right, so our format for tonight is an evolution of our comments section program. So if any of you were at these earlier ones, we were sitting in a very small room in a circle, kind of talking at each other. We've scaled a little bit, but we still want to keep that ethos for tonight's program. So if you do have a question throughout the night, there's a mic located in the center aisle. We'd welcome you to pop up, grab it, so that your questions and comments can be recorded tonight along with our panel conversation. And so we'd really like you to be part. Uh, we'll also have time for questions at the end. So if you do have something you'd like to hold, uh, please do so and make sure that you get that microphone. And we also encourage you to extend the conversation beyond tonight's program through Twitter uh, using the following hashtags and handles to do so. All right, so curating the internet. This is not a new conversation by any means, uh, but it is an ongoing conversation. Everyone has kind of been a curator for decades, maybe. Uh, so digital curation, as we think about it, uh, as a selection, preservation, maintenance, archiving of digital assets, is as old as the medium's emergence. The notion of curating as a social activity, however, uh, seemed to come from contemporary art's understanding of cura curation as an authorial act. In 2003, a New York Times writer uh, sort of presently identified an emergence of like a cultural curator. That's one of the first times it was recognized in print um, as being an exciting moment when the musicians on 
uh, Apple, like App, I, iTunes, Apple, started to make their own playlists. And that was a real turning point as far as playlists, mixed CDs, used to always come from record companies. So we think about record companies like publishers, like museums, uh, they've historically served as professional authorities for recognizing and publicizing the work of artists. And this moment really recognized an important power shift, right? So and then that takes us into the mid-2000s, uh, where the web gave rise to kind of like a new sort of super ego of the individual uh, by way of confessional, maybe oversharing culture, uh, which really resulted from earlier platforms uh, like personal blogging and that sort of thing. So think about this as being the history foregrounding tonight's topic. Uh, at present day, low barriers to production and circulation of images uh, through blogs, social media sites, et cetera, have really added to this like endless glut of data out there. Whether it's educational or it's entertainment, so much of it's free, there's a ton of information out there. We also have phones with us everywhere we go, which means that the web is now ubiquitous and sort of ever-present, and that also allows us as individuals to be telepresent and omnipresent. We can be posting data anywhere we go, we can be responding to everything from our meals to museum experiences, and we have apps that are made just for us so that we can organize all of those ideas and curate them in the palm of our hand. So that's where we are. Now think also along these lines about the role of a museum curator. Uh, someone typically called upon to care for a rarefied object. Uh, maybe if we think about the internet now being full of this glut of content, um, museum curators tend to focus on where there's scarcity. So Digitals in dig, or curators in digital space are maybe also in public spaces as well, asserting their role in reaction to an overwhelming abundance of cultural information and artifacts that are already within the public domain. So digital curation essentially uh, addresses two parallel trends, and that's where we'll focus tonight's conversation. The first is this explosive growth of data and our need to make information coherent and manageable uh, to really like make things in contextual groupings, right? Uh, this is also coupled with the horizontal nature of the internet, this huge network where everything is essentially equally accessible. All right. So we've set the stage a bit for our uh, current digital landscape and, and noting that this is not uh, a newfound conversation. Um, and now I'd like to share some of our panelists' projects and learn a bit more about their individual relationships with digital content and curation, uh, as well as maybe how they're responding to this, these two parallel tracks within their own practices. And first up to bat is Andy Adams, who has very generously joined us here from Madison. Um, thanks for making the drive and joining us this evening. Yeah, Andy, through your work with Flack Photo, um, you've provided a platform, and you really refer to it as a channel, for presenting the work of artists and curators and other arts organizations. Um, in many ways, you have sort of formed a new institution, right? Like picking up where maybe digital uh, exhibitions happened online and also the way that uh, maybe publications have evolved also. Do you want to tell us a little bit about Flag Photo? Yeah, sure. Um, just show of hands, are there, uh, are there photographers out there? I bet that's half the room. Okay, cool, a lot of photographers. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, so I'm Andy, I live in Madison. I love the internet and I love photography and it just so happens that those two things kind of marry together wonderfully. And uh, I do all kinds of different things. It's kind of interesting to be here today on a panel Focus on the word curate, because certainly inside the photography community, and I think that you photographers out there bet are familiar with this, it's a very hot button word. And it's a word that a lot of, um, a lot of folks get kind of uh, hot and bothered over. It's, it's misuse. And uh, it's also a word that I have a great uh, deal of respect and admiration for, um, it was specifically for those uh, for those folks that have done the schoolwork and, and study and uh, have you know gone down the route of a, being a professional curator. People always call me a curator, and I have dodged that term 
for a long time, uh, namely because I never thought of myself as a curator. I, I was really, go ahead. You, you refer to yourself as an editor, right? Or yeah, well, I mean, yeah. so here's the thing. I, uh, I got really interested in the web and I was always interested in broadcasting, always interested in publishing and wanted to make a magazine. And I also love pictures. And so it was kind of a natural fit for me in about 2004 to put those interests together. And uh, so, yeah, right, right up here. So I, I, I launched this website in 2004 or five. kind of officially uh, bought a domain and made it flacphoto.com in 2006. And the whole premise there was that I would show a photo a day uh, from photographers around the world. Uh, like a lot of, like everyone here, I was realizing that the web was a social place, that those of us that cared about photography came to the web to feed that passion. And most people were using blogs to show their own photographs. I decided I wanted to show other people's photographs. And um, al you know, along the way, I've kind of, fortunately, the practice has evolved, and I've, I, I've done a number of different kinds of things. Museums have invited me now to officially curate exhibitions. I'm always interested in building a better website. Uh, and I'm also really interested in the way that mobile media and uh, social media and digital technologies in general impact the way that we discover things that we're interested in. Uh, and also the way that touchscreen technologies uh, give us new kinds of consumption experiences. So this project ex started as a, as a bloggy experiment. It became a way to shine light on work I admired. Uh, it, at, at its root, I was over at MCAT earlier today talking to students, and we were talking about the elevator pitch, right? Like how you describe what you do in a, in a short moment. And I, I ultimately said, look, I'm, I wear different hats. I'm a director, I'm a producer, I'm an editor, I'm a curator. Ultimately, I use the internet to promote photography. That's ultimately what I do. And I have, over the last 10 years, uh, the website celebrates decade of publication this year. Uh, over the last 10 years, I have essentially leveraged every tool available to me to do various aspects of, of that particular role, which is to show images, I promote books, uh, I also actively uh, tweet and just promote links related to arts, creative culture, photography culture, articles, interviews, essays, etc. I've published interviews. Uh, so really, the project for me is, uh, is, it's very much a creative act. It's about uh, exploring and experimenting with that intersection of digital culture and photographic mm -hmm. practice. And it's also extremely rooted in a desire to, to showcase work that I think is interesting and to drive attention using the power of the click and the link to those people that I think are doing cool stuff. That's well said. And you've also had the opportunity to bring this very you know, ephemeral, circulatable place and platform offline as well. And that some of your interest in maybe some of the touch screen and, and uh, IRL experiences right, <laughs> with, right. with photo. I'm going to just pull up an image uh, that sort of transposes this, this act of digital pointing mm -hmm. to uh, a real brick and mortar space where, yeah. where you're able to compose exhibitions offline as well. Uh, should I talk about that a little bit? Sure, yeah, let's take a So this moment. picture behind us here, this is a touch screen exhibition, a digital exhibition. I guess you could call it an exhibition. I like to just call it a photography experience because why use old terms to describe new things? Uh, but this is a project that I did in collaboration with the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art in Kansas City. Uh, it was a contemporary show of, of printed portrait photography and the museum invited me to curate a show of, of uh, uh, drawn from the online community of, of uh, current portrait photography. And uh, really the big impetus for me uh, with this project, uh, it's always uh, an experiment of form and content. Photography obviously plays a critical role, but really experimenting with the container and the package and how you actually engage with the photography is a real big part of it for me. And uh, I'd seen John Gossage, the bookmaker. Some of you photography book collectors probably know Gossage. And he gave a talk at one point I saw in New York and he said, uh, photography books are objects of fascination. And he talked all about the contained universe of a book and how books function X, Y, and Z sorts of ways. And I thought, you know, websites are also objects of fascination. And so the whole goal here was to create, uh, along the lines of a photography book, a sustained sort of long form experience. And so what we did here was in the museum, we showed touchscreen uh, monitors in, in uh, relationship to the prints. And then we also created this sort of web-based public art exhibition that was broadcast, or you know, that lives online and was visible to the world. And the whole concept was sort of part public art exhibition as well as online publication. We featured long form interviews with the photographers. And the point being that you could try trying to do different things with digital that you can't necessarily do with analog. Sure. Sure, sure. I thank you so much for introduction to Flag Photo and to the ethos of the sort of projects that you do. We'll move down to page now, and I want to put pins in like at least nine or ten of the things you said, and we'll come back to those and have a group discussion in a moment. 
So next up is, is Paige Gugamis. And Paige, you actually started out with a brick and mortar space uh, several years ago here in the Twin Cities called Tarnish and Gold. And since your practice has evolved uh, from this physical curating and, and exhibition producing to digital curation, do you want to talk a little bit about your, your sort of flagship site, Lazy Geometry? Sure. Um, Lazy Geometry just started as a personal blog. Um, I grew up online. I love the internet. I've always had a personal blog. Um, and so this one was kind of the first time that I tried to step outside of myself and stopped just putting up my own content and started collecting content um, just from stuff that I thought was being missed elsewhere. Like, if I was seeing it, then I didn't need to post it. And so I was kind of just searching for little gems, the same way that we were doing with our gallery space. It was like, who wasn't represented? Um, how could I bring that into a digital space? And so it just started as a little thing that I would throw up, you know, every day or two, I'd add an image, um, and it's become sort of like an obsessive nature to collect anything and everything that I can, um, and then sort of go back and whittle, whittle down over time. So I actually will post and then remove, and then post and then remove. Um, just to capture a feeling of time and space. Ultimately, I want to create something that's now, um, but still like timeless, I guess. And what might be some of the, uh, the criteria for what makes the cut on lazy geometry? Ooh, there's no limits and there's no rules, um, much like most of the internet. Um, but I think it comes down to visual nature. I'm a visual person, so it's like, what sticks with me? What do I think about later? What do I remember um, without actually looking at the site? That's kind of what cuts, cuts through. And from Lazy Geometry, you started really working with Tumblr as as medium for hosting a whole wealth of, of like tributary sites, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, another project was let's see here, is this MPLS Pizza Club? Yeah. <laughs> This site delights me very much. Good, I'm glad. It's just totally mm -hmm. for fun. Um, this one actually drives as well from a physical experience. Pizza Club's a real thing. Um, we meet regularly. I meet by myself at Pizza Club a few times a week. Um, <laughs> so I just wanted to sort of like document what my experiences were and like why I like pizza. I worked in pizza for a long time and so it was always present and people were always sharing pizza information with me or what they thought was funny. Um, and pizza just started to mean community for me. Um, so that's kind of what this site is about. And it's mostly just to be relatable and to be fun. Um, I think you know, most people have had pizza, have some memory with pizza. Um, so I'm just kind it's of It's really universal. Yeah. yeah, it is. Pizza is totally universal. And so it's just a documentation of, I don't know, everyone expressing, you know, what they love about it. And I've really enjoyed curating that into, like, you know, what I think is fun. And um, the challenge with pizza is, like, everybody gets certain pizza stories. So there's a lot of things that hit like the main pizza culture, I guess. And what I'm trying to capture isn't necessarily what is always like the first image that you would see. I try to go a few levels below that. I like that. And I'm, I know in speaking with you earlier, you had mentioned the incident of Pizza Rat, which I'm sure everyone in the room, have you seen the internet, you have seen Pizza Rat, perhaps, yeah. that you didn't want like the most circulated Pizza Rat image. It had right. to be like the obscure one. Exactly. I so love like, that. You know, within 24 hours, there was all this pizza rat art. People had like put out t-shirts and like made plush toys. And so that was like what I was trying to share. It was like, oh, you like pizza rat? Like what else do we have? You yeah, know? kind of the thing becomes another thing. Exactly. And you're hosting a container for all of those things together. And I, I know that you are really drawn to Tumblr and that's sort of your medium of choice. Tell us a bit why, why Tumblr is uh, the ideal format for telling these sort of like relationships and stories between images? Okay, uh, I just love Tumblr. Like I said, I've been online forever um, and tried so many blogs and just didn't really feel like any of them were as smooth or as interesting or had the users or the content to them um, that was organized in a way that I could pull up anything in like a second. Um, you can respond with GIFs. You could have conversations on Tumblr without actually ever typing anything if you wanted to. I just think it's versatile and interesting um, in a way that a lot of platforms aren't. And kind of like Andy, I've never really thought of myself as a curator. I've kind of ridden this line of 
being like a user on the internet, and that's what I liked about the Tumblr format, is there's no pressure to create a platform or even generate your own content. Um, so it's just open. And uh, you've, beyond these sort of um, artistic tumblers you've created, you also have some more utilitarian ones. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pull up a slide for Good Space and how. Tell me a bit about how this is different than the interests that drive the other ones as far as utility versus expression. Okay, this one just kind of started as like the bookmarking. I think everybody has some way that they save things that they saw online that they want to be able to retrieve later. I'm actually building a screen printing studio slash home right now with my partner. And so I just wanted to document ideas that we had or spaces that I thought were cool or anything that I felt just represented the space that I would want to be in. And so it was initially private. Um, because I like to embrace the digital nature of blogs, I thought, well, if I'm wanting to save this, then you know maybe somebody else would want to see it too. I might as well make it available. No, that makes sense. And thanks for the brief introduction to your work. I know you have probably nine other tumblers that we could be talking about tonight, but it's a great overview. And um, I've, I've picked up on a couple of things you mentioned as well that I know are going to relate to some of your panelists' ideas. So um, we'll hang on to those and come back and have a thorough conversation. Next up is Mina. I mean, you know, Vedakar, in your own practice, uh, you're kind of interested in reclaiming and transforming public spaces. And so I'd love to take a quick look at a couple of those projects so that we can uh, introduce folks to your work and then move on to, to your role and relationship with digital culture. Uh, do you want to tell us what this first one is here? Uh, so the first one is called Forward 50. Uh, and uh, it was a participatory projection uh, as part of Secret City Festival uh, in Minneapolis. And the, the whole idea was to you know, bring the images that I found on the internet about, you know, the dreams and desires for future and really making a comparison with the participants uh, and thinking about the idea, what do we want to see in Minneapolis in 50 years from now? And it turned into a series, um, you know, I took that platform in, you know, a few other places. Uh, throughout Minneapolis and, uh, you know, I would call it, it was, uh, you know, a co-creating practice or act with the participants, um, you know, kind of combining uh, found images and, you know, hand-drawn and, you know, uh, visual and verbal communication that happened uh, when it was uh, taking place. Um, the second one is uh, similar as in, uh, I decided to take a notch up, and uh, this was at uh, Wiseman Museum uh, as part of the freshman welcome hmm. week. Um, I said, you know, uh, you know, you know, the campus and uh, you know, people who live around university, uh, we don't all speak the same language. Even like myself, I, you know, think in three different languages. So, what if we leave the words behind and only communicate in visuals, and you know, have that dialogue uh, live uh, and make it open to uh, public and participants? So this was the idea of you know just drawing and you know like not using words but communicating with each other and just making mess. Uh, while there was uh, there were two bands playing, so it was kind of like call and response with that music, and uh, you know I, I really enjoyed that. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I'll pull up one more. Uh, this project is uh, called Take the Field. It's the second project in the series. Um, this happened in 2014 um, on Kicks Field, and it was uh, you know, part of uh, Northern Spark and uh, Greenway Glow. Uh, that's a fundraiser for uh, Midtown Greenway Coalition. Um, and I worked with uh, a team, uh, you know, to make all these uh, LED shapes. Uh, basically, I went around, talked to people in Phillips neighborhood, uh, you know, around their houses, and you know, uh, collecting stories. And um, I was also making, you know, marks, uh, you know, abstract shapes that I found around that area, or so, you know, uh, parts of the artworks in the in that area, uh, like murals. And uh, you know, select a few. Actually, there were 500, and uh, some volunteers and uh, a team helped me, you know, put these together. And um, the idea was to, you know, bring these memories from the community uh, onto a sports field, and transforming the space for a for a night 
uh, into community space. So kind of like taking away that private uh, authority and you know just thinking about a different urban landscape for for a night. And uh, the like uh, we lifted these uh, forms up in the air, kind of like mimicking the constellation. And you know what if we animate the lines that are on soccer field? Uh, you know, what if we are under those lines, you know? So there were a few ideas that, uh, you know, were, yeah, I experimented with that. Well, thanks for sharing those. I, I know when we talked earlier, you were sort of like, uh, I don't know if we should show my work. I don't really work in the digital sphere in that way. And then the more I hear you talk about your work uh, in, in uh, synchronous with the rest of the panel, you're really dealing with a lot of the same concepts of you know, taking circulated images and letting a community sort of drive them uh, while providing a container for them. And uh, I think that that's really striking. And also, like, how do you, you are going out to the community and finding images. It's just a different community. It's a, a real one as opposed to a photographic community or a pizza community. You're still pulling those things um, from those locales and, and providing a, a housing for them. Um, also, when we spoke, you mentioned uh, something that was exciting when, when Paige said it as well, that you think of yourself as a, a user more than like a, a curator or producer, that sort of thing, especially with relation to the digital. Do you want to talk a little bit about your own position as a user within this uh, con yes, context? Yes, as in I love internet. I don't... Uh, well, at, at one point, I used it, uh, you know, just creating work off of internet and putting it back on, on the web. And uh, I realized, uh, you know, like we have paper brain and Kindle brain. Uh, so that way, I feel I have offline brain and online brain. And the offline brain has more needs or, you know, more unresolved issues that I want to work with. So, you know, I often, uh, you know, bring ideas and uh, you know like images uh, you know off of internet uh, I'm more of an observer as in you know on, on social media you will find me you know mostly observing not m contributing much but you know I contribute as in I tie everything together and make a package you know out of these projects or maybe um, you're more like a behavioralist yes and uh, you know recently I started calling myself you know human participant. Uh, partially because, uh, you know, probably half of the week I spend time, you know, talking to engineers like data miners and um, also, you know, uh, hiring people over hourly nerd. You know, they are mostly from Ukraine and some other places. Uh, I started feeling the need and I was already, you know, uh, totally interested in this idea probably for last decade, uh, you know, uh, examining community and place. Uh, so uh, I, I started thinking how this internet, you know, the, the world uh, that we think, you know, it's, it's an entity itself. And we play these different roles, as in we are teachers and students of internet. Um, so how can we, you know, bring that and, you know, become producer of meaning? And I think it's one of the, uh, you know, feature of being a curator. So how can we make that meaning offline? So, you know, that's what... That's the driving force behind most of my project. And um, I, I was talking to Paige just before the panel, and uh, you know, I mentioned um, all these projects. You know, they have a need of connecting. You know, like I want to be connected in the community and know more people. So I kind of, you know, uh, use internet as um, like a pipeline for raw material, mm -hmm. and then you know, work it around and co-curate it with the participants and audience, and you know, uh, place it in public art. Thank you. I'm going to take a moment before we go to Steve and say there are five seats in the front row. So if you would like to sit down for the duration of the program, come join us. Any of you. <laughs> and next up is Steve Dietz. Steve, you've held the title of digital curator or curator of new media here at the Walker. Your history with the medium is incredibly deep. Uh, so sort of you've really been on the scene well in advance of this terminology being applied to sort of content assembly um, and this deep history you've also curated several exhibitions you want to tell us a little bit about your curatorial projects either with new media gallery nine or or beyond independently you have a, a deep history uh, yeah, well, first of all, I, I mean, I just want to thank you for inviting me, and uh, I think this is a great topic. It's obviously very rich, and I just, I hope that I'm sort of playing the 
Bernie Sanders role and not the Hillary Clinton, okay? Just get that out on the table. Um, so I, but before I, I think part of people that have heard me, I mean, I really only know a few things and I repeat them a lot. <laughs> and um, there are three things that I just want to sort of point out in response to this great conversation so far, which then relate to the work that I'm doing. And the first is, I think we're the subject of a tidal wave. And so in 1970, the French um, social scientist, Alan Nink, uh, Nink, Mink and Nora created a, a report called The Computerization of Society in French. And they basically said that two trends, computation and networks, coming together in 1970 would change the world. And they have changed the world, and art is part of the world. And so we're sort of trying to catch up to that tidal wave, and it's not surprising that we're part of it. And I think that's tremendously exciting, but there's no particular um, valorization of the role of the art world in that tidal wave uh, necessarily. Sure. Um, I think the other thing is, you know, one of my maxims is uh, from Catherine Hales and and um, and Jeffrey. Um, I'm blanking his name right now, but what's the difference that makes a difference? And so once we start, talk, start talking about curating as being, I love the idea of the cheese plate, you're curating the cheese plate. And so we can say that, and of course it, it, it makes certain sense, but in a certain, at a certain point, once everything becomes curating, then what's the difference that it's making? And I loved your phrase of producers of meaning, and I think that's what you've all been talking about, and we've all been talking about. And so, you know, how much is it a semantic issue, and what's, at the, what's underlying that issue, which I think is exactly the panel that, that you're putting together. And then the third thing is actually, this is somewhat recent realization. I always used to think about and talk about the internet as a virtual public space. And I think in a very accurate way it is, just in the way that the, the, the um, plaza in front of a corporate building is a public space that's privately owned. And so I don't think we should kid ourselves that any of these platforms are public. They're all controlled by licenses that we sign and that we give up lots of rights and they can disappear and we don't necessarily have access to them. And so when we think about them as being totally accessible, it's a really accessible to what? To a corporately owned internet. And that's really a hard thing to think about and not necessarily a fun thing, but I think it's an important thing. And these were some of the issues that I, um, was dealing with, you know, as, as, a, as a small group at the Walker, the new media program, and we started Gallery 9, which was a place where we were thinking about the internet as more than a distribution medium, but as a medium for creation. And essentially, we commissioned projects, and we collaborated, and we looked at projects that were, now we know, the terminology born digital. And, you know, and so that's what that was starting out to be. And um, at a certain point, uh, November 2000, uh, one of the projects that we commissioned was by an artist, um, Mark, uh, Merrick Walzak and Martin Wattenberg, two really amazing artists, and you've probably seen a lot of their work. And it was this idea of going back, again, what's the, what's the analog history that we can go to and learn from? And so the Wunderkammer was actually very similar to Tumblr. Right? It was people's interest in like, let's pull this skull and this feather and this fake over here and put it in a collection and call it a Wunderkammer, and it was science. And then it became a museum. And I think that's one of the things that a Tumblr is. And so we wanted to think about, uh, one of the things we were thinking a lot about at the Walker is how can we not only be a Walker Art Center, but how can we be a node in a network? And how can we provide a place for people to collect things? And so it was, trying to give people the ability to go to the internet and identify a link and then create an icon that they ha would hand draw and put into the Wonder Walker, Wunderkammer. And so it was an online digital artwork that anyone could contribute to um, at the time. And it, so yeah, that's that project. No, I love the relationship between the Wunderkammer and the tumblers of today. It's really just, yeah, organizing things that you're fascinated in, and yeah. that's a, a really great parallel. Um, I'll pull up a couple more pieces if you'd like to share. This looks like. So this was, I think, like Mina and, and probably everyone here, I'm very interested in that intersection between the virtual and the physical. 
and I always say that, you know, until we can all jack in, like Neuromancer, there's always going to be that analog interface to the internet. Like, we still remain mostly water with some, you know, physical things going on. And there has to be that connection, and so what's, what is that connection of the, between the physical and the virtual? And so, there's a lot of um, interesting parts to this program called translocations, but part of it was creating a temporary autonomous Sarai with Rock's Media Collective and Atelier Bawa, which is a physical viewing space, somewhat inspired by the idea of Dan Graham's video viewing rooms. It's like, how do, what are the, what's the way of creating a viewing space for the internet in a museum context? And then as part of that, we um, invited curators from all over the world, from South Africa, from Brazil, from Mexico, from Japan, to program 24 hours a day into the Walker Art Center so that we were literally a node on an international network of programs trying to really invert that notion of the systematic center to a, a, to a network. And um, so that was what that was project was about. And uh, this is another example I think we've all talked about a little bit here of creating a thing and filling a thing and sort of the difference between those and when that happens online or off. Um, this, this last image we have for you, Steve, is from Fair Assembly. Do you want to talk a bit about this particular project as it might relate to online and off? Sure. This is a project that um, where I had a, a small part in a, um, an exhibition that Bruno Latour and Peter Weibel curated called um, uh, the pub public sphere, and basically it was this notion of, Latour had this notion that you could create a parliament of everything now that you had the internet. Sort of, again, some of the things that we've been talking about, but how do you curate it? And so one of the models that I was interested in is this notion that there's a kind of um, basic uh, criterion to get into a platform, pizza. And then anyone can contribute to that, but there's also, the, so it's completely open, but then some of those pieces become curated or written about, so it's by paying attention to it, like you were talking about, you're promoting things, that you add value, and that can be you as a curator, it can be other people in the community, but it's one way to think about an open source um, community that also has some curation going on, which is really based on this notion of paying attention. I think that's an interesting way to start thinking about curation as maybe dictating the size or shape of the door that things go through, um, whether that's a pizza-shaped door or a photo-shaped door or, or what, whatever that tends to be. But that's maybe one way, so, so a filter, if, if you will, or a category. And this is a nice way to, to bring ourselves to a conversation um, that might just help us establish a little bit of criteria around that, that tricky word, that thorny word, which is curation. And in thinking about what curation might mean as a group, maybe we can just have a, a gentle conversation of semantics so that we can either crack open some of those doors or toss out some ideas that we feel are antiquated as a panel and move forward. So I'm going to pull a quote from uh, this, this book by Sternberg Press, which is called uh, Cultures of the Curatorial. And in the introduction, uh, it states that the curatorial has developed as a field of overlapping and intertwining activities, tasks, and roles that were formerly divided and more clearly attributed to different professions, institutions, and disciplines. This development has affected the notion of curating, particularly an activity of putting things together, and has widened its scope beyond showing or presenting to include enabling, making public, educating, analyzing, criticizing, theorizing, editing, and staging. So I, now that we have a bucket list out that we can <laughs> review, I'd be curious uh, to, to point back to you. Um, we'd had some conversation or conversation had went there earlier where Andy had kind of said, I'm not a curator, I participate in these activities. So maybe we could each share some definitions beyond those expressed on the slide as to what curation means for us in sort of regardless of context. Jump on it. Sorry, I have, I have a, this is one of my two things that I know. Um, <laughs> What I say about curating, for me personally, is that I see it as a following trend. Mm. And so I'm following the artists. It's not about leading or creating new knowledge or, or leading the way. I, and um, I think that's very different from a lot of curators. And I think the other thing I say is that 
it's a functional thing. And so my curation is my point of view. It's not the voice of God, it's not even the voice of the institution, it's a personal point of view, and it's either useful to you or not. And that's a personal reaction on your point part, and it's something that only takes place over time. But it's, I look at it as a functional thing. Either my curation is useful to you or it's not. Uh, I can go ahead as in, uh, and I'm, I have a few notes as in I just wrote down some keywords as I was thinking about it for last couple of days. Uh, I, yeah, as in curator for me is a producer of meaning, you know, first and foremost. Uh, it, curator also plays the role of ma map maker. Uh, you know, just, just bringing these ideas together and bringing some clarity uh, to some of the phenomenons and, you know, uh, also uh, looking at the incremental changes of the reality and being a follower of that reality and making that available. Uh, I think it's much more personal, as in uh, curator is not different than the person, you know, that is, and a curator can be even uh, a, a sociobot, as in it can be a computer. It, or a, or a machine, but it's not different than its own nature. So, you know, uh, I, I don't think there is a collective curate, curator. Uh, there is co-curator, but there is no collective curator. So that's how I think about it. Um, I also thought, uh, you know, curator is also education hacker, like edu hacker. Uh, it, I think curator comes out and you know challenges the traditional uh, placement of some of these uh, ideas in in culture or you know in in any form even you know um, the way we know how we make friends or how, which friends we keep curator jumps in and you know uh, decides to hack that idea and we come up with a different set of friends uh, in, in different places so I think that you know the hacking like self hacking is active in curator. I guess yes and yes. Uh, yeah. I like Steve's idea about attention because I think about what I do all the time in relation to that thing which is an increasingly scarce commodity, right? Um, I don't know about you guys, but I'm addicted to my phone. Like I can't really help myself. I look at it even when I know I, I should be preparing to go to sleep and like going offline, I can't really help myself. and and. Uh, and yet I don't even always know what I'm looking for when I look at the thing. And so, eh, that sounds a little goofy, but what I appreciate it is... It doesn't sound that goofy. Okay, cool, cool, good. <laughs> <laughs> You're not alone, Andy. No, no. Um, and, and yet, what, I think what, what makes sense there is that I actually have this craving to, to consume things that interest me. And I don't actually know that what, I know what I'm doing is not significantly different than what a lot of other people have done to precede me. That may or might, people who don't even call themselves curators, essentially they're, they're just saying, check this thing out. If you like what I like, you might dig this too. And uh, so I show photography and I, and I promote books. And I also just really actively promote links to interesting things related to photography. And this is going to sound sort of disparaging, but lots of times I just call myself a link jockey because I, I think of myself like a disc jockey in a way. Uh, there are, there's tons and tons of great songs out there. There's tons and tons of interesting links out there. And I get a lot of, per and the other thing that these, both of these guys said that I really associate with is, is a, a real personal pleasure uh, from actually just doing the, the curating, the organizing, the aggregating of the, the information. It, it's, it's a bit more service oriented for you. Might Does be. Does that sound, yeah. Yeah, maybe, yeah, I mean, I, the other thing is, a lot, my, my projects have a very, and I think Steve and I probably have some things in common from what I understand of what he's done. There's a real strong community component to what I do. I'm, I'm very interested not just in showing things, but in engaging the audience and uh, you know, kickstarting conversations about the things that I'm actually suggesting we all consider together. So I host photography-related uh, groups on Facebook where the whole purpose is to ask and answer questions. The whole purpose is to say, let's go check this thing out and then let's have a conversation about it online, remotely and asynchronously. And so part of what I'm, what I'm interested in doing is driving attention to certain images or ideas and then, uh, very much like you were describing, uh, really, I consider myself just part of the community as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm learning along with everybody else. 
And so maybe we can add the word like facilitator or guide along with. Yeah, or, or, yeah, I, I, a host almost. Host, kind yeah, of no, way. that's hospitable. Um, how about for you, Paige? Do you have other terms or criteria you'd like to apply to, to that tricky word of curating? I mean, I think I agree with everyone. Like, yes, 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 definitely. And I, I'm just kind of scared by the idea that it can be, curation can be anything. Um, but I also sort of believe that. Like, I think it's about promotion. I think it's about pleasure. Like, it comes out of, you know, a personal filter. Um, I do think it's, like, so much just about sharing. I think what I think of curation is a, in a classic sense. I think of something that's like archival and you're presenting it and you're connecting dots. Um, so ultimately, I think if we're going to talk about like elevator pitch, that just comes down to sharing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I'm thinking other definitions for curator might be gatekeeper or connoisseur or maybe aficionado, I mean. Or maybe geek. A geek, yeah, if you just mm -hmm. geek out about something, mm -hmm. that's also a connoisseurship, I would believe. Um, so I'm gonna, thinking about the multiple aspects of your practice, um, when we think curators in a traditional sense, sometimes we think about uh, expert in their field. That was what I was sort of getting at by connoisseurship or like the expert that's called in for their field knowledge. Um, so what does it mean to be a curator who's flexible in that position, who maybe moves between identities like all of us do up here, uh, from party thrower to organizer to consultant to director to artist? Uh, what does it mean to sort of the expertise provided? Uh, does that ever offset the validity of the voice? Uh, what is a, how does a fluid curator, someone who moves between things, compare to the traditions of an expert? Maybe it has to do, for me, I think, when you're going to define like, expertise, I think it would imply like understanding of a large realm of something. Like, mm. You really have to know what's out there to say that you can give an informed opinion or an informed presentation. But expertise is tricky. But I would look at you as a pizza expert, though. I mean, sure. there's no dime. I put in the time. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of pizza time. Yeah. So maybe the, the other way to flip the question is, do you think of yourselves as specialists or generalists? I definitely don't. Well, I mean, I, I guess I specialize in, in pictures. Uh, but no, I mean, I'm, I'm not a scholarly expert. I am a guy that loves photography and is obsessed with it and spends most of my spare time looking at it and learning about it and studying it and wanting to understand it. And How's that different than a scholar? I don't know that it is really that different other than I don't, I guess I ultimately don't claim to be an authority. That's really the mm -hmm. distinction. Mm -hmm. um, what's true for me and uh, you know, if any of you guys know anything about what I do, what's true is that if you look en at enough uh, black photos, you'll see me in those pictures. I mean, there's a style that I'm drawn to. There's an aesthetic that is my uh, a kind of an aesthetic that I think sort of defines what I like. Sometimes I feel like I need to see broader than I do. Um, but yeah, for, for me, I, I, I don't claim to be an authority. I don't claim that the things that I do are somehow hierarchically superior to other, other uh, images or ideas that exist in the culture. Uh, I, I say, if you're interested in the kinds of things that I'm interested, come along and check this out. I think you'll you'll enjoy it, and and hopefully you'll get something out of it. Can can I just uh, I don't know if it's pushing back or asking or so it, it seems like there's a difference between authority and authorization, and um, you are authority in terms of your your project and your platform, and I think that um, part of what I would say is that. We have to own up to that and be transparent about it, and it's not, and it's really based on this is what I meant by being useful. That you, the reason you have X followers and it's succeeded for a, a decade is because of your authority with images. But that's not an authority that's given by an institution. It's an authority that's earned sure. every day through your experience and, and through your publics and through your public, but also that people can push back and just say that's crap, <laughs> right? You know, that's, uh, that's all, he, he really likes people with blue eyes or, you know, whatever, I don't know what it is, but, 
Um, and it's that, keeping that, those communications open seem to be more important than trying to avoid the idea that we're authorities in our fields. I mean, the idea that we're not authoring our platforms is a little bit of subterfuge. Yeah. I, I agree with you. Um, but we don't like the word authority, I right? I agree with that. So I have a compromise. Yeah, Bernie, I come propose on. a compromise. <laughs> Producers of meaning. Influencer. Influencer. As in, it, influencer can have its own positive and negative connotations. And you know, it, if you are a good influencer, I think you gain that authority out of respect. Uh, so I, I like that word. And uh, I think if we are you know fixated in idea of uh, you know examining expressions and you know uh, making notes and uh, you know presenting or even you know savoring by yourself i think we are all on the path of being you know like a curator expert uh, so we cannot be generalist but we can be general practitioner of curator you know considering web and you know even the offline knowledge is so you know like widespread and you know, just abundance. I'm not gonna let you get away with that. <laughs> okay. Because you set up a you set up a structure when you do your public program where you have to draw in this way, and you have to draw in this. So you're providing a structure where you are even as even though anyone can in theory contribute, that you're still creating a frame that is part of your authority. I'm not saying it's bad. For sure, but it's it's more than being an influencer. When you set up a frame, you're creating an authoring situation. Yes, I, I agree with that. As in, I make those decisions beforehand, and you know, just uh, simple uh, decisions like, okay, you are using black sharpie and not you know white pen. Um, so yes, as in, I do have authority. As in, I influence the process. I think you know beyond that, uh, I'm a platform provider. <laughs> And then I play the role of you know influencer, and um, actually I forgot to mention one thing. As in in these uh, live projections, um, you know it came uh, from this uh, you know the GOP debates and you know everything that was happening two years ago. You know, two sides of Congress were not talking to each other. So I came. Uh, I started experimenting with you know pairing up two strangers and you know let them have conversation let them play with these images and add their own thoughts um, and come up with the you know idea that's a dream but that is you know common to both of them or to that group so i think yes as in when, when that process was happening i was being that you know like a coordinator or influencer and uh, so yes as in i don't totally disagree with you now <laughs> And I, another idea that just kind of occurs to me, I, I, this, I don't even know if this is true, but I know I feel that what I'm doing is is creative. Like it's there, it's, 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 there is a creative act involved in doing these things. So, you know, I, it's kind of crazy, but like if you like a particular filmmaker, you're gonna go check out what he or she does based on her, or you know, based on the reputation of their previous work alone, and I, you know, I, I def, I come from a very non-traditional photography art. I don't, I didn't study art in school. I did study the aesthetics of cinema. I studied the history of of broadcasting. Uh, so everything I do sort of is rooted in in that in that framework, and uh, and yet. You know, maybe this relates to the the, the personal and and pleasure seeking aspects that we discussed. But I guess I'd like to think that what, that there's a place, and I don't even know it's a new thing in, in this internet moment, but that there's a place for these to be purely creative acts that are just acts of personal expression by way of of uh, assembling presentation, uh, by shining lights on, on on image makers, by by making connections, by you know I inspiring ideas, and in theory maybe the authority. I, 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 I guess I bristle at authority, but maybe the influence or perhaps even just the impact on the audience has to do with uh, whether or not you've consistently given them something that they think rhymes with what they are into. Mm -hmm. You know, like w w with a sense of style, and in a way, it's maybe not unlike a record label that you used to really like, or a certain genre of music that you're generally interested in. Um, so I don't know. 
I just that know. pointed the conversation in a really interesting direction, Andy, because I think the notion of the record company is one that is something that maybe started independently by someone who was passionate, who was an influencer, um, that then once it's the company is now its own sort of institution. So my, my next question for you, you perfectly segued, is uh, can the art, uh, internet allow artists a means to sort of jettison the formal structures of like the authority, the wall, the gatekeeper, the institution, um, and form that new artistic expression? Or are they also just as doomed, perhaps, to institutionalize as well? Uh, have they already? I mean, after 10 years, you, you are maybe a institution with it. You're a pillar within the photo community. So what, what is it, uh, what is to be said about building institutions and building platforms in this space? Can I just go back? Yes, I guess you can. I think that um, there's like different levels to it, and I don't really think that it's linear. So it's like there's authority doesn't necessarily isn't the top, and influencer isn't necessarily below that. I think they're linked. So once you're an influencer, you are an authority. Is how I'd look at it. Um, and I think I think it's both of these things. I think there's the opportunity to just express or What's, what's our other word? In, be an institution, um, or be both, or be neither, and, and still be involved and still be curating. So I, for my personal experience is that I feel like I'm just expressing. Um, I don't feel like I'm an institution, but when you look at like Andy's work or what y'all have done, it is a little different. Or maybe to your followers, you are. Like if, if someone's following you and every time that you know, ping happens, they're like, I got to see this. So is it a question yeah. of establishment? That'd be awesome if every time that your audience got a ping, they wanted to look. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That would mean that you were consistently giving them something good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, right? That's a great thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I often think of that, you know, that ambiguous balance of, uh, you know, authoritative curation and, uh, like, crowdsourced curation, as in, there, there are examples. Uh, museums have, uh, you know, just set out images uh, and, you know, took a poll or, you know, had people choose over Instagram and that became the next show. Uh, there is, you know, if that happens, then probably, I, I did not go to any of those shows, but, you know, I was just like thinking, this is like a fantasy football. You know, it is. It could be relevant for the people who came across that uh, you know post or who were on the internet at that time, and then it becomes representation of them, but may not be you know very balanced expression um, of what that you know that museums or that community's mission is. Uh, so I was I think of that you know like where is that balance or how that balance shifts, um, and kind of like uh, you know like going back. Um, I think that question, like building platforms and institution, or uh, you know, bringing changes, it's it's totally needed and it's long overdue. I have, as in, this is like a you know, it opens up so much, so many things in my mind. Um, first of all, as in internet, it's a, it's a technical product, and uh, so yes, it it comes with its advantages and disadvantages. So we can you know, that's one route of examining that. Um, it's a great deal of collaboration, and we haven't seen a lot of that, as in that uh, you, know, you can preserve something or you can keep changing something. So, you know, there are, I, I believe uh, when it comes to curation and internet and even, you know, these offline institutions, museums, um, I believe that, as in the strengths are their weaknesses and weaknesses are their strength, and that somehow kind of makes them more human. And we haven't really explored in that idea. There, there can be explosion of you know, collaborative curation, we haven't seen that. So I know you didn't want to do everything, but yeah. I mean, to me, platform is a little bit like a dog whistle for me, so. <laughs> um, I think platform's a really important idea, and it's not the same as an institution, because for me, a platform is something where there's a set of rules that allow people to interact with it that are open enough that you don't know what the results will be, but, but designed enough that the results will be good. And a really good platform will allow interactions that m turn it into something that you weren't necessarily expecting or planning. And that's pretty often different from an institution which tries to 
hang on to itself. And so though everyone saw the, you know, the New York Times article on Sunday or whenever recently about the 10 things that museums need to learn, one of them I think is they need to learn how to be platforms and let the users in the world change them and not feel like there's a difference between being an institution and keeping your, 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 your products or your, your collection safe. And they're not the same thing. And you can be an open platform as an institution. So I think that platforms don't necessarily become institutions, but they do when they stop being open to change. Well stated. Anyone else have any remarks with regard to platform for expression? I guess I link the word platform to user-driven. Um, I love the internet because it's about the user, to me, um, more than it is about the platforms or the institutions. Those change over time, but we're all users, probably for life. Um, and so I just like that the user can drive the platform. It can change it. What started as one thing can become another thing. An app design for one purpose could completely change in any amount of time. Um, but I've never drawn that line, so I'm really interested in what you just said about how a platform would become an institution or what the, the rules are for that. Yeah, I, I, maybe building on that, the only thing that I think I could, that I might add to that is that I don't know that any of us here have set out to become institutions, but I'll bet that we're all more nimble and flexible than any institution on account of the fact that it's us <laughs> without a committee. The humanity. It begs the question, do you want to be an institution? I mean, I don't actually know. I, one, of the, one of the great parts of, of the Black Photo Project is the ability to improvise and adapt and play around and experiment. And I, don't, and I, I would assume, and because I've, I've been employed by institutions, uh, that's all, it gets a lot harder, the, you know, the more sort of entrenched you get in the rules it's of what who I've you heard. are. Yeah, right? Yeah, right, exactly. So, yeah, maybe, I, I, I guess at this point, I, 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 I like that sort of nimble, flexible, uh, the smallness, and I think that there's real benefit to that. And I think perhaps, you know, that might actually be one of the defining characteristics of this moment where everyone is a channel and you broadcast yourself and you get, you know, that's, I don't mean to say broadcast yourself, but where you get to be what you want to be when you want to be it. And I think that might relate to what you're saying in terms of, you know, off and on at the same time. Mm -hmm. Good thoughts, you guys. I'm going to keep moving along as so we can hit a couple more points and then break to questions. I'm going to pivot us a little bit with a quote from Clay Shirky who said, Surplus always breaks more things than scarcity. Scarcity means valuable things become more valuable, a conceptually easy change to integrate. Surplus, on the other hand, means previously valuable things stop becoming valuable, which freaks people out. And I thought this was a great question for us tonight um, as we think about really how do we cope with so much data? That's my question to you. Isn't it a good problem to have? Oh, I didn't say it was a problem. I'm just saying, what do we do with it? How do we cope? How do we respond? Obsessively organize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do you mean we as in we, or we as in we? Like I mean both. I mean, as, as individual practitioners and as, as a group, what do we do with, with our own habits? Uh, does, does, uh, do we need to limit a supply to make meaning? Or can we make meaning out of the masses? I hope we can make meaning out of the masses because that's what we're dealing with. I think we're all driving content. So, I mean, there's how many billion people on Earth? If everyone even created just one thing that exists in a digital space, that's a huge amount of content to, to deal with. And the reality is that we're driving so much more data than that. I don't think it's a problem. But it is overwhelming, and it is hard to find quality. Uh, so, I mean, I, I agree that more data is probably better than restricted data. But one of the interesting side effects of, you know, one of those in, unintended consequences, we created um, interstate, we created roads, which created suburbs, which created climate change. Right, because of all, you know, so there's like these unintended consequences. And so one of the un unintended consequences of huge data is that we tend to close in on um, 
people that, and sources that we already agree with. And I think that that makes the uh, understanding of other points of view and the, the need to address them problematic. I mean, you all are probably much more uh, responsible about that I am, but I tend to sort of like, you know, read my sources and not their sources. And so that's one of the ways that's common to deal with too much data, and that seems to me to be a problem, not necessarily inherent in a lot of data, but just one of those consequences of it. Um, I kind of am I'm stuck on these two words, in surplus and scarcity, and mm. you know, data. Uh, data for data's sake, you know, which I encounter many hours a week, uh, it's just you know one-sided look at you know uh, objectification of data that can be sorted and organized. Uh, I tend to you think of data as uh, you know a bag of things. You know, as we move through our life and you know situations, uh, they change places. They they are in that bag, but they are you know they are moving around. So uh, you know once you start looking at data from different perspective. I think you know it just opens up so many ideas, and scarcity is uh, you know it's something artificial. I believe um, it's internet. You can you can make you know millions of replicas of something yeah. uh, in different formats, and uh, I, I think from uh, you know like a uh, so many you know point of views as in the travels I have made and my whole background in India, uh, scarcity means. Uh, it's time to innovate. As in when something, uh, say for example, you know, there is a, a book or even work of art that is never going to come to, you know, uh, your town, uh, you will see people making their own versions or, you know, uh, start making their own collection and selling it. Uh, there is a term called jugad. actually it was, it, it's a uh, Hindi word, but it was uh, invented in Twin Cities by a marketing professional. Uh, her name is Simon Ahuja. Uh, Jugar is, is just, you know, that uh, taking over scarcity and creating your own authority over the supply and demand and, you know, creating your own message. So, uh, yeah, it's like putting things together and, you know, making their own. If they're not available, kind make your like own. Kind of like a playful counterfeiting, is that? Yes, <laughs> okay. yes. And a whole lot of things come in that, as in like pirated CDs to you sure. know uh, fake artworks to uh, just you know uh, making mashup of artworks. Uh, also, uh, you know, surplus is um, I, I I think it's you know it creates that abundance and you can you can really go crazy and you know uh, yeah it's like you know uh, artists with so much stuff in their studios you know just you feel overwhelmed. And I think it's a, it's a good problem to have, as in like, uh, yeah, as in uh, it just, it's a fodder for your creativity. So I think, uh, you know, as a curator, particularly on the internet, it's, we, we come across this surplus, and then we rethink about ourselves and our reaction to that. And I believe uh, if we, if we come start to collaborate between these pockets, as in uh, just for example, um, curator is also a caretaker, right? So if we think of these caretakers that are in their traditional roles, you know, maybe nurses, and if you, if you pair artists or curators with these traditional caretakers and imagine the collection that they will choose, you know, so surplus brings up these opportunities. Can I try one more thing? Uh -huh. So, I, I mean, one way to think about surplus is it's just unevenly distributed. And so, like the future, but another way of thinking about it is in Europe, and it's probably the same in the United States, 40% of food product is wasted. And if we were able to distribute that better, there wouldn't be a scarcity in some parts of the world and a surplus in others. There would be enough food to feed you know, a, a very dire situation. And so thinking about surplus as a distribution issue or a systems issue is, a di is also a way that I sometimes like to think about it. That makes sense too. It makes me think of some of your work page where you're finding like the most unseen pizza rat and circulating that because everyone's seen like the, the most you know, common meme. So that's an interesting way to think about scarcity and abundance. 
think it kind of takes care of itself. Like if it's not being used and no one cares, then it just kind of disappears. And maybe it exists, um, but if it's not needed, then it's not around. I think especially in like a culture where everything is exciting for a day and then forgotten, that's especially true. And because I believe there's such a surplus, I don't think it's a scarcity at all. But I think those words are weird to me because they imply that we like need all of the data. We don't really need or Maybe it. not necessarily need, but the impetus to collect. Mm -hmm. And when we pair that need to collect with the, the offline realm, right? That's a primary reason museums of any variety put things in their collections mm -hmm. is that there's you know, perceived, they're perceived to be rare. There's a, they're a rarity and they want you know, to have one of those. Uh, to hold and preserve for, for futures to come. And so I wonder if that's why, particularly in the art and, and culture sector, we have trouble sort of thinking about collecting digital things because while they're passing, they, it doesn't seem as though they're, they're rare, if and that, that makes sure. sense. Even though they do pass, I mean, things move and the churn is fast. So what are your thoughts about that? In the last thing, I'll, well, just that surplus yeah. piece, I mean, I think it's a good problem to have. It's, I know, I'm sure many of you are like me, you have a voracious desire to consume it all, which is mm -hmm. impossible and maddening, and, and yet kind of thrilling because the surplus actually is evidence that we have more choice than ever before, which is, I think, a really good thing. Um, in a way, maybe it's, I'm reminded of that MC Escher drawing hands drawing, right? Because in a way, from my, like I use Twitter every day and I love it, and it's, it's, it's my number one source of discovery for all kinds of things, not just photo art and so forth. Uh, and in 2016, I, the, great, the great majority of, the, of my trusted sources are not traditionally trusted sources. And so in a way, part of the way that I cope is, I mean, I'm a digital geek, so I really get a lot of pleasure out of designing systems to, to try and tame the flood and, and, and sort of keep things orderly and, and track things. And at the same time, it, by, because we now live in a moment where really anyone can be out there suggesting things, uh, I think part of the way that you cope is to embrace the tools, to be able to make meaning for yourself instead of just sitting back and allowing traditional channels to give you things. I, I actually think that it, Yes, it's a problem, and I, I, in the photography community, there's there's been much criticism about the fact that there are way too many images, or that the internet is inherently uh, a bad platform for paying attention. I think those are that's user error. I mean, I really think that that's just because we're maybe taking the challenges presented to us and solving them the wrong way. I I, I, I do really think that the one way to cope is by understanding how the systems work and proactively designing solutions to be able to get the good stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a way, I think maybe it brings us back to the start by looking to non-traditional mm -hmm. uh, voices that you trust to, uh, to point you in the direction of you know, the good stuff. So. Sure, I'm, I'm a bit surprised we haven't yet uh, had anyone bring up filters or tagging or those sort of organizational tool sets to wade through those things. <laughs> and certainly you've all created frameworks or doors that are shapes for things to move through. Um, what might we think about in terms of, of making a meaning by, by way of framework or by way of tool set? I have a lot of opinions about this, but yeah. I don't know if any of them are you know, universal. But for me, I think when hashtags came out, people were kind of afraid of them, and like some people didn't understand them for years. And I'm sure there's people that are using them that don't quite still understand them. Um, I love them. I think they're amazing. I think when you think about curating on the internet, if you want to look at it, like you are trying to create like archival images or work or text or whatever you're trying to create, hashtags are the most powerful tool for doing that because anybody can look it up. 
Um, I think unique hashtags are really exciting to me. Like if you put in a hashtag that no one has ever used before, you feel like you just stepped into original territory, like you created a space that didn't exist before. Um, and then within a day, maybe that is used thousands of times. Like we created one tonight, and before that, there's probably no content there. And then at the end of the tonight, there will be content that we can pull up for years to come. I think that's awesome. Yeah, it's like drawing a door. Ex yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's a door that's shaped like you and me, and you know exactly. Yeah, and I guess I'd add on to that. I mean, related to the coping question, the surplus question, hashtags in particular, but then hashtags just as a as an example of a of a new kind of uh, thought like thought technology or sort of ephemeral cataloging tool that, that doesn't necessarily actually exist, but it, it does in your mind. Uh, I think lots of times in terms of digital literacy, which is that these are tools that are available to us, and we have two choices, to either be overwhelmed by them, not embrace them, and, and, and lose out on the opportunities that they, they pose, or to dive in, understand, learn new tools, teach ourselves new tools, make new habits, make new routines, and then reap the benefits. And, and you know, the best case scenario, I think, is that we embrace the surplus, that we learn how to tame the stream, and uh, make ourselves more informed in the process. You know, broader even than a museum or an art conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it's just anything in, in, in the world. Uh, to me, it's really exciting. And I think that there's a learning curve, to be sure. Uh, but I think the rewards are far outweigh the, the, the costs. That's the really great advice. Anyone else have thoughts on that? Uh, I think tools are, tools can be transformed. Or you, know, you can transform yourself in a tool. And uh, you know, uh, not just individual basis, but uh, even museums, uh, you know, they, they can use some of these spaces as blank canvases, and you know, just just giving a promise that you know this is a tool. There will be a new uh, you know piece of public art or piece of work every time you walk in. Uh, so you know, these non-traditional places can be turned into these tools. Um, in thinking of you know uh, tools and you know boxes and frameworks, uh, I, I will embed that in uh, with technology, and you know again when it's a product of technology and uh, it hasn't tested extensively with users and a variety of users, a diverse base of users, they reach their limitations very quickly. And I believe we are all having this, you know, uh, love and hate relationship with social apps. You know, we know their limitations, but, you know, we don't have any better tools out there. So I think that box, you know, that resistance you know, is, is in that form of expression uh, that we need these tools. And, uh, you know, it's, a lot of them are based on uh, how we use it and not what we use it for. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's like, you know, one of my big question is in when can we break these boxes and, uh, you know, think of the, the hashtag is one of the solution as in uh, you can move uh, beyond the genres and these uh, boundaries of these apps and websites and, uh, you know, uh, really curate your content. Uh, that brings us to surplus as in back again. And uh, one quality I, I notice about surplus is, um, it is it is kind of a mirror of, uh, you know, mm, the community issues and social justice issues that we have. Um, social and cultural curation is possible through that surplus. Uh, and I think it just amplifies, uh, you know, some of the matters that we're facing. And, you know, that, that can create urgent need to look into those matters and, you know, do something about them. So I think surplus provides that opportunity. At the same time, uh, you know, I, I still believe it's, you know, strength is the weakness and weakness is the strength. Um, so uh, yes, as in looking, thinking about you know social justice matters just around us. Um, one, as in uh, one thing I noticed, uh, I, I went to buy this uh, Black Lives Matter T-shirt, and I found that nobody sells uh, women's T-shirts anymore. As in beyond the now the protest has ended. Really, as in I sent out call over you know Facebook and uh, you know some a few people they kept uh, sending me leads and I kept calling them and finally uh, you know I placed order at uh, Ancestry Books 
Uh, they have a pop-up on every Saturday, so if anybody wants it, you know, just go there. But, you know, again, this, this idea that, um, you know, maybe women are not active you know, enough, so let's not make t-shirts. I, I don't know what was happening. I'm not going to just you know, make speculations, but. Some kind of data drill, yes, something, these, yeah. Yes, these, these you know, tiny issues, they, they blow up, or you know, issues in feminism, how we, how we connect different uh, age groups together. You know, all these issues, they, they just become bigger uh, when, we, as in when we start sorting through data, uh, or when they come to, to internet, they just become bigger. So you know we we will see more issues and but we will see uh, you know come up with uh, more ideas how to resolve them. Mina dropping really good advice tonight. <laughs> I'm like yeah, I mean that was well said. Uh, I'm going to scoot us along to one more question, then we'll take questions from the audience. And this is a bit in, involved with, with tool sets, right? And we've talked a bit about, about hashtags and filters and the design of things. Uh, I'm going to throw another quote. This is from Will Brand, who's ex-editor of Art F City. Uh, he, he left a few years back. But at one point, he mentioned that if we strip out the myriad social and administrative tasks of the real-life curator, the connections, the negotiations, the shipping and hanging and lighting and writing, we can arrive at a pretty simple job description. Good curation is the discovery and display of unexpected and heretofore unknown patterns and flows in visual culture. He says, so why can't a computer do that? And <laughs> I would like a, a computer <laughs> does do that. I mean, I think yeah, that, that's you know, the code this is the, and I think this relates to what you're saying, Mina, that the code is already curating everything that we see. Mm -hmm. And that's why, that's part of that, starting to see just things that are part of, already part of your world. It's also why Target may know, you know, that you're pregnant before you do. Right? That's the, that famous example of analyzing the Target, the data, and based on what the woman was buying, they sent her a, something for um, pregnancy, uh, for having a, you know being a kid and she didn't know she was pregnant yet and so this is a re this is part of not having an open internet where we don't know what the algorithms are that are create that are curating what our experience of the internet is so you know i, I think it's both an openness issue and a little bit of a i mean i call it a, a powers of 10 issue and so that for some people working with code is at the level of hexadecimal. For other people, it's at the level of HTML. For other people, it's at the level of the at sign on Twitter. You know, and, and all of those are sort of valid, but they're, they, they give you different access to what's really happening under there. And, and it's, a, it's a big problem if we don't know what the algorithms are. Well, sure, um, because certainly, like the the job of hand picking is much more expensive than a line of code. Um, but when things are handed over to things like Amazon, Facebook, Google to make decisions, in those circumstances and in, in targets, doesn't then your history create your future? And wouldn't that, in a way, narrow it as well? Y yes. <laughs> so that's. Maybe troublesome. Yeah, but I suppose yeah. you just want to. I mean, from my perspective, as a, a as an, a frequent user and total evangelist for things like Spotify and Netflix, uh, I'm constantly being. If you consider part of the value uh, of a good curator, or even just a trusted curator, and to say nothing of whether or not he's he or she's good. Um, if part of the value that that person brings to you is that they're constantly uh, helping you discover something new and interesting that you're interested in, and you're compelled to dig deeper, and you're compelled to to give some of your uh, attention, which we've already established is just, you know one of the scarcest commodities around, uh, if, if that discovery value is actually a part of the equation, then probably the best situation is to balance, you know, go go with people and go with a machine and do, do a little bit of both. And and hopefully the machine, I mean, I'll tell you, Spotify's constantly giving me all kinds of interesting things that I didn't know about that I like. They keep giving me white stripes. I don't know why. <laughs> Just because I haven't the, the, liked it yet. Yeah, well, yeah. The, the corollary, though, is that you're right. I think that, uh, you know, and this is where I think in a, in a, 
in a present and future where, uh, and I'm, I'm confident that algorithmic curation is only just beginning and will continue to drive content consumption across the board. Uh, I think the danger there, to Steve's point, is if you would rely exclusively on that, then in a way you're probably no more informed than if you only watch mainstream media and consume you know, mainstream traditional channels. That's, I think, the interesting tension for me is that this trust, maybe where it can come from an influencer or an authority, uh, what happens when it comes from a consumer-based good? And how does that change sort of the impact of, of what, you, what, you, what culture you take in? Uh, kind of like follow up to Steve's uh, remark, um, I, I, I think you know, algorithms are codes by themselves. Uh, they tend to push ours, uh, push us towards uh, safe choices or you know a very conservative mindset. So uh, you know, I love automation as in uh, in, in in some form as in uh, it can be an assistant to our agenda for better humanity. And as long as they are in that role, and you know the risk taker is a a well-curated human mind. Uh, I believe, you know, uh, it just it just becomes more accelerated process uh, rather than relying on just code itself. It's just lazy way out. I have, I have like a love-hate thing for algorithms, but I think like yes, like code curates constantly. Um, I think I liked your example of Netflix because it's not what I thought at first. Like when I think of algorithms or like code curating, I think like. My Facebook feed is selected for me. Um, and it's like sometimes anti-user. Like if I were to write the word today, then that's not going to show up in anybody's feed until tomorrow just because I wrote today and Facebook wants me to pay for it. So I think in that way, it's sort of curating, but it's like not curate. It's like doing the opposite. It should be showing me, but it's not. And I think that's where it's like humans are win every time. But then I think about like Netflix, where I've spent like you know hours rating everything I really like, so that it will show me stuff I like, and it's pretty spot on. I mean, it, it'll be like you're gonna love this, and you give it five stars, and I'm like, you're right, I did, I did love it. Why did I wait two years of you showing me that <laughs> movie image every day before I picked it? So it's like I think code curates absolutely, um, but is it always good at it? No. I've heard uh, on the Netflix note that. They're, they, not us as raters, as they rate, they tend to always uh, like low rate things because they don't want to like totally overshoot your sure. expectations, which I thought was kind of interesting too that like they're trying to tailor to our most like middle of the road kind of taste. It's safe or lazy. Yes, yeah. safe and lazy, yeah, yeah. Steve. Well, I think the other thing that's lost in that is that um, Netflix will never give you an algorithm that says, maybe you should be reading a book, or maybe you should be talking to your spouse, <laughs> right? And so we talk about how good the algorithm is to consume. They do ask if I'm still but watching, but though. <laughs> when, you, when, you watch too, when you're too much binge watching, they ask that. But my, my point is that it, it creates a context that is just assumed, so that we're we're the fish in the aquarium, and we don't We don't know that this water is going around. And I think that that's. I mean, it's just something to. One can be more or less aware of, but they're certainly not going to help you. I don't mean to be contrary, but I'm just hopeful. I actually think that. Go ahead. Oh yeah. I, at this point, I think it's extremely early days for machine learning, and I really think that. Uh, it's possible that it could be incredible. I mean, it's it's possible that it could just be uh, boring and and not in the long run. I mean, and not actually giving us something that's truly quality in the long run. But I actually think that it's maybe possible that the system, if if tagged and cataloged uh, as effectively as a human would catalog some kind of a physical collection, or maybe even more so, and it's possible actually that that surplus actually might even be able to serve up things to us that we never even knew that we wanted. I, I, mean, I just want to be optimistic. Maybe in five years we'll come back here and you'll say, I told you so, Adam. No, no, but it's nice to be optimistic, but I think you have to look at the systems. So, I mean, two things. One they is, have an incentive to get me to keep using it. So the better they make point. it, the more I'll but use two, it. Two things, and one is that the tagging, so this is where, you know, I have a little bit of PTSD around this, but you know, in many, many, many years ago, I was involved in early 
system that's trying to get library systems, which use C39.50, and archive systems and museum management systems to talk to each other. And the idea was SGML, and that you can create a DTD that sort of allows you to tag everything. And it just becomes an impossible task. And so the, the, it's actually the artificial learning and an open natural language learning that's going to go to figure things out. And I agree with you. I think there's lots of possibility there on the technical side. But then you have to look at who owns it. The internet is not an open system. Their, their goal is not to make your life what it could be. It's get to sell you things. Sure. And how do you get outside of that? The only way you can get outside of that, if, the, if there is really a public space that doesn't have a backdoor to the FBI, that doesn't have physical taps on transatlantic tables, that doesn't have everything that it does have. And so it, the optimism of the algorithm, to me, is warranted. The, scare, the scariness of the ownership of public resources is pay attention to those shrink wraps. Fair. <laughs> Thank you. I, I then I agree with you about you know the internet being well. Internet makes us readable and not you know it doesn't give that authority to execute something. Um, but here is is a question as in you know for for everybody and you know uh, about you or you know thinking about uh, you know someone who has lots of knowledge about a field and you know you have tons of uh, information and material in your mind. Uh, and you know, uh, having access to you is, is one way to you know, know a little bit about that. Um, but you know, I, I think uh, you know, thinking of succession you know, of a community of a person, you know, it, I'm thinking in terms of knowledge base. Then algorithms and codes can be a tool, as in I totally agree that you know, we are not using it for that purpose, but they have ability or you know power to to do that and collaboration is one way as in you know going back to you know we are using tools that were not meant uh, for artists and we are still making art out of it or we are still curating uh, you know visual content in it so you know we we are desperate to do that and you know just these algorithms can be helpful uh, to distribute knowledge and you know uh, same way you know uh, for others to get access to that knowledge as in just through some random algorithm I landed to flag photo on Instagram you know probably last nice year work sometime. algorithm so, <laughs> <laughs> so yes isn't that there are possibilities but you know we need to really come together and you know, sit with people and do something like that. I, one thing that comes to my mind, there is this new startup scene coming in, uh, or rather coming up in Twin Cities. And uh, till last year, it was all about, uh, you know, this min, min bar or, uh, you know, like startup weekend that happens twice a year. Um, starting this year, they are going to work on themes, which you know, was very appealing to me. Uh, the one happened just last, last month in February, and um, you know, the, uh, the whole idea was to uh, you know, create apps or create technological solutions uh, for better education. And you know, they did one good thing. They, they paired up educators or people who are interested in learning and teaching. Uh, and uh, they did not ask uh, you know, software engineers to come up with ideas. They asked educators to come with your problem or you know, an idea that you don't know how to do it, but you think it's possible and it's going to uh, change how we learn things. And we were given uh, you know, like 60 seconds to give a pitch. And people just raised hand that, hey, I will, I'll do this part, I'll do that part. And you get a team. And uh, you literally make that app overnight. And next day, you present it to investors. Uh, and you, know, you, you might get like $1,000, $5,000, or nobody got a million, for sure. Uh, but the ideas that came through, and I really love the idea of that collaboration, as in collaborating with uh, technology, and just making these small prototypes. And they're happening in person. So that you know that pleasure is there that you are you know trying to do something new and um, you know there were some some great ideas as in few I liked was uh, teaching or rather uh, art mentoring to uh, kids in juvenile prison. So you know uh, art teachers sitting you know outside 
you know, uh, using these art therapy tools to communicate with these kids and creating, you know, small forums within them. So things like that are, are totally possible. You know, we are not just doing it. Any other thoughts from the panel? Or I'm realizing we're, we're getting late, late into the evening, and I want to make room for questions as well. Uh, so if, if you guys have had any, any it's not final thoughts, but just want to make sure we got everyone a chance. Are there any questions from the crowd that uh, you'd like to? We do have a mic right in the middle aisle, and I don't make any one meaning to do like a merry-go-round kind of thing, but now we can record your voice, we can hear you. Hi, uh, thank you all so much. I, I'm really curious and I've been frustrated that it seems like what's lost in this is the role of the artist, the producer of the data. And I'm curious your reflections on how this might change the expectations for that person. Um, in addition to making work, is it the artist's job to make sure it's hashtagged appropriately? Uh, I have a lot of other questions about that. But I'm, I guess just reflections on how does this impact the role um, of the maker? My feedback, I don't know if it's an opinion, but my feedback about what works um, or your best chance at being represented if you're an artist uploading content is to hashtag it, watermark it, do anything you can to keep it from being stolen. And so many people don't even want to upload high res images because they will be stolen and reused and misused. Um, I think that's what's different about digital curating than like physical space curating, is that artists are very well represented by you know an expert curator in a gallery. You know who made the image online. You may never know who made the image. So it's it's totally different. So are you saying you're suggesting the artist should create artificial scarcity? Kind of, or at least just like mark mark what you can. You know, so much gets lost almost immediately, or can be changed, or crop. You, you know, even put your name on the bottom, that can be cropped out. So does that sort of answer your question? I, I mean, I want to respond that, like, so what's the responsibility of the curator in that situation to make sure the artist is getting credit for that? And is it that same model, Steve, maybe you were referring to, uh, you know, if it was the whole model where you would be represented by a gallery, there's someone looking out for your interests. So are you saying that that whole model is still somewhat in play? Well, uh, no, well, I mean, it is somewhat in play. It's, it's, it's you know, in terms of market, it's, it's probably, well, I, it is st still somewhat in play. I mean, part of what I would say, and this is what, to me, the value of an institution is that it has a responsibility to care for your work, to retain it. And one of the things I said when I started Gallery 9 to artists was, you shouldn't have to be figuring out how to run your own server to be able to present your work, because that the artists were the first ones figuring that out. And that should be the role of the walker. And our initial thought was that we would, we would instantiate a new server for every single artist commission that we would do. Which is to say, I, I think that, and one of the things I want to say to earlier, I think, authoring or authority, the reason it's important is because with great authority becomes great responsibility. And you know, and I mean that sincerely. I think it, the re curator does have res responsibility for how it's shown. I do think the platform does have responsibility for what happens, but the result of um, uh, micro-grants and crowdfunding is that more and more pressure is being put on the end user, whether it's serving your own, you know, filling your own gas tank or finding your own funding. So there is a real pressure and there's a value. That's why I always argue there's a value for that curator platform that we, we're not, I'm not just, you know, this vampire, but you're, you have to provide a real service in order to be of use. I've got one short answer. That's sort of a, a continuation of something I said previously. I think that uh, every creator uh, would benefit from becoming conversant in the tools and making it a point to be digitally literate in addition to making the work. Um, 
And you know, tonight's been really interesting for me just to hear how other people think about what they do and to draw parallels to what I'm also doing. Um, I think that the artist, the, the maker of any kind, benefits from saying, how do I plug what I'm doing into, into the machine? How do I actually get my work out there and proactively take my fate into my own hands? So I, I think personally the photographers that I'm most inspired by are those people that make incredible images and produce really interesting bodies of work and are also simultaneously extremely savvy with, with how the web works and figure out how to put it in front of me and everybody else. So you know, I, I, a short answer is uh, learn how to use the web in addition to doing whatever you do that might not even have anything to do with the web. Uh, yes to all, and I would you know, just, just go out there and say, you know, we are all artists, we can help each other. So let's play this, you know, uh, roles for each other. As in, if uh, someone doesn't know web, uh, and you know, there are so many gaps, so, but we can fill them for each other. And, uh, you know, if we own, you know, this idea of being artists and artist groups, as in, as, as a community, uh, you know, we can think about solutions and, you know, not get lost in, in this, you know, uh, data ocean. You know, something that happened in photography, as in at, at one point, you know, a, an image that was uh, probably $400 on uh, Corbis just became 10 cents and then ju just became free. It, it's kind of, you know, if we just look for, each, you know, ourselves, that's where we are headed. So it's just that sharing and, you know, nurturing each other's work and, you know, making sure everybody's alive. <laughs> That aspect of caretaking we've sort of been talking about all night as well. Are there more questions? Um, please help yourself to the mic. Hi. So um, I'd like to start out by saying that I do come from like an art education background, specifically focusing in digital environments and coded environments, as well as being a producer of physical and digital work. Um, and I wanted to go back to this conversation of authority versus versus authorization. Um, personally, I see that there is like a very clear difference between being an authority and a curator and being a consumer and a consumer slash producer. Um, producing an intentional space versus consuming for consuming sake and producing for consuming sake um, kind of challenges the validity of what the conversation is being brought up. And, and so I was thinking, um, it does bring up a dilemma of institutional versus individual expression, um, but I wanted to kind of direct a question towards Paige um, about a user-driven platform and how you said that Tumblr is user-driven, user but I wanted to challenge that because it's not open source. It's not user-driven, really. I mean, the, the, the content is mm -hmm. pushed along by users, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, but really the only choice that you have is choosing your aesthetic. Mm -hmm. And you don't really have much of a, it has less of an impact to me than a space or platform that's intentionally created or coded to sort of house ideas. So um, do you personally see a difference between general consumer and production in that way and an intentionally produced and curated coded space? I mean, I think, I guess I think of it as user driven because Tumblr isn't pushing content and you can change algorithms, you can choose, um, you can create your own template to use it, you can select what content you're shown, you can do searches and control the algorithms that you see, but you're right, like, um, that's not like a true user driven platform, um, but I think well, it's just really tricky. It's all about how it's used to me. So there's people on there that are just consuming to consume, and I think that's probably most of Tumblr. Um, and then there's other people that are never actually checking a feed and only uploading content. Um, but I think there's most people that are using Tumblr as like a social platform are doing a little bit of both and creating things based off of what they see and then sharing and then it's changed and it's back. Um, if you don't mind if I add on to that really sure. quick. Um, the ways you said you can create your own algorithms. 
I don't think that's true. I guess they, you, they right. make the choices for you, how you can upload, the way that you can type it, and obviously you can change how it looks. And, guess, and the order of, of content and how you're creating that. But I, uh, referring directly to like Douglas Rushkoff's Program or Be Programmed, it's one of my, I think it's an important book to sort of read and understand um, that if you're not understanding how these things are working, and I'm not saying you specifically, but sure. the general population that I feel like you're representing of the Tumblr mm -hmm. aesthetic, um, don't understand how these things work. And I feel sure. like it loses some of the val validity of curation because of that lack of connect to how the, the, the machine actually operates. So I don't know if that's really a question, but I kind of just wanted to throw that thought out there. It's been like in my head for a long time. No, so I, think, I, kinda... I think you're right. And I think that's like not just Tumblr specific. That's an issue with like all platforms. And I guess when I say that you create your own algorithm, I don't mean that you actually create it. You're not creating the code. You don't actually control that part. But you do get to have some choice and decision in how you use it and what you see in it, pretty much every aspect of it. Um, and it's so different for everyone. One more thing. You, you're choosing from the choices given to you already. Or you're what you add. From, mm, not really, because what you add is limited by what they have already coded. You can't go into their code, change it, and make it your own. It's not open source. It's sure. But you can code your own site within Tumblr. HTML and CSS is not the same sure. structural, the structural, um, the, the structure of it. <laughs> sure, but you're still creating within the platform. So that's how I look at it. Okay. Can I just add one? I mean, basically, I agree with you that that's absolutely true. <laughs> That you you don't have the, you don't control the means of production, and so there are these choices that are being made for you, and we don't necessarily understand it. But the 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 tension is that what people want and is so wonderful is the size of the network, and so it's it's that it's the tyranny of the network effect. And so if you can make your own site that 20 people who already know you can follow versus making using Tumblr or Facebook or whatever, and a million people will follow you, that's a tough distinction to, to, to deal with. And, and so we have these, you know, it's, we have these first movers in the network, Amazon, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, that have tremendous power that's so hard to overcome precisely because of the size of their network, which is what we're at some level so many of us are after and so it's a really tough question but i think that the having at least the option for tools and creating open source networks is an important it's sort of like it is really important okay yeah, i i agree with you totally and you know with with you steve uh, i also feel this you know i hear you these boxes are suffocating as in they are you know uh, con controlling our size and our desires within within them. Um, I just want to give one example, you know, how my parents just, you know, uh, created their own rules. As in, I sent them a, a link, as in it was a collection. I don't believe it was on Tumblr, probably on Facebook. It was just album. Uh, and what they did was, um, I, I could see they took pictures of a screen of the images that they liked, placed it on, as in gave it away uh, to my relatives. Uh, one of my cousins, uh, you know, took three of those, so it was being, you know, recurated in, in every step. Um, took it to his office. Uh, it was in his cube. Uh, he took photographs. Then a couple of my other cousins, you know, shared their photographs, you know, either on fridge or, you know, in their cube or office. Or one was literally, you know, uh, stuck on a bike, bike as in motorcycle. Uh, and then my brother, he made a collection of all these you know, uh, pictures, you know, that travel to these places and a collection, co-collection of, uh, you know, these cousins curated uh, stream. So I, I really find it, you know, it's, it's a creative way, you know, coming back to that idea of Jugaad as in just, you know, inserting your own rules that may not be technical. Uh, but 
you know, yes, as I totally agree, and I feel that need that we need to break these boxes and really, you know, work around, you know, what we are trying to do, you know, on this, you know, huge net, huge web, and not how we do it. It's not, it's not really about, you know, this uh, set of rules or, you know, like um, photo versus video versus drawing versus, you know, sound file. We just need to break these boundaries. I, I don't know how otherwise I would, you know, really do it. But I, I'm, I'm just going to state that need and, you know, collaborative, you know, approach is probably the only solution. I'm curious to see how it'll change as the generation that's growing up right now. Like, are the people that are in their teens and 20-somethings, are they going to understand, like, more than we do? You know, are they going to be able to, like, I think, like it was Steve was saying earlier about the corporations own these platforms. Like, ultimately, are we using things that are just tools to sell to us? Like, yes. Um, and so are like digital natives going to be able to just embrace that? Or are they gonna fight against it more? You know, I don't know. But right now, I think what's happening is that the users are just using the tools. And so that's how I embrace, you know, the, the platform. And like, it's not totally open, it's not totally mine, um, but I make it mine. So that's how I, I look at it. And what I like about Tumblr, or you know, it's not even, I guess, what I have the most experience with, but to me it seems like of all the platforms that I've used, the one I'm being sold to the least. And it's changed a little bit. Advertising is actually becoming huge. They just added, you can shop right on Tumblr, so I'm sure even in like six months I won't feel that way. Um, but that's how I felt about it. And, and I do think creative use is one of those, can be an anarchic moment. Mm -hmm. It may not change the system, but it, it you know, I think, I'm not, I, I think it's open, you know, that's what we all try and do in any system is how do we find ways to navigate it and to sort of upset it where we want to upset it. So I, you know, I think that's definitely true, but so it's, you know, I'm optimistic. Good, I want to be too. Let's be optimistic. Any, any other questions? Hi, thank you all for being here. I want to ask, um, you talk about how these digital spaces are sites where you've used to kind of express your personal views or opinions or likes, um, how you've used these spaces to cultivate ideas or communities, and at other times to promote books or artists. Um, I want to ask, how do you, if you do, promote yourself or engage, um, engage users? and how do you define success? Thinking back to this idea of the platform versus institution, the platform being more um, flexible, is it kind of a self-satisfaction which kind of draws others in, or do you feel like you have to um, invest a lot into it, I guess? Uh, I guess from my perspective, uh, how do I engage the audience? I just talk to the audience. I just I, I write in the first person. I say it's Andy. I uh, you know like uh, if I'm and there are any number of instances. Cause I, you have a question. You want to say something? Well, just I guess m maybe to add clarity or focus. Yeah. Um, as you're starting this site and sort of you know just putting out there your likes or thoughts, how um, how did you gain an audience? How did that kind of how did that begin? Obviously, maybe Tumblr friends see that you're on there, et cetera. They kind of join in. The Walker has a name, a reputation, so maybe others are kind of funneling in through that that realm, I'm thinking maybe of a, of a beginning site where you're trying to curate or host ideas. How much uh, promotion do you do, or how do you kind of um, gain an audience? Okay. Maybe? Yeah, that, that, yeah, well, okay, so just from my perspective, fortunately at this point I don't have to hustle it as hard to get yeah. attention to the project, but um, Sometimes I talk about, I think about Flack Photo as an iceberg and like the website or the social media channels, the Instagram, Twitter, whatever, they're just the tip. And like the great majority of what is down beneath the surface is just tons and tons and tons of correspondence. Mm -hmm. uh, for me personally, the reward is connecting with fellow creatives, meeting photographers I admire, making things and, and co-creating and collaborating with people from around the world. Um, the project actually, for me, has its origins in a, 
like a, a like a Google group dating back to like 2003. So it was actually like kind of social media before the term was coined. Um, and uh, a big part of what I do is uh, I ask the, the public web to be a part of the things that I'm doing. And uh, I also really do enjoy the promotional aspect of the project. Not other, other people don't, don't do that. But I actually have always found great pleasure in doing that part of it. So in the beginning, it was just lots and lots of, lots of hustling. I'm Andy. I'm doing this thing. Can we do something together? And fortunately, at this point, um, more people come to me and, and want to be involved in something than, but you know, it's just a result of lots and lots of actual participation in the community. Yeah, as in, I, I totally agree with uh, you know Andy's answer. And actually, I have the exact same question. As in, I'm uh, as in thinking of audience. As in, audience doesn't come to me. I have to go to the audience. And uh, you know, going back when I was using digital medium as as, in, as, a, as a photojournalist, uh, I was taking digital photographs. But you know, I, I found myself. Uh, showing them offline when I was traveling to different continents, you know, just to you know create that relationship of you know who I am, where I come from, what I do. Um, so I kind of you know take that same practice, you know, here as in again like you know this between offline brain and online brain. Uh, I'm catering more to my offline needs. Uh, you know, they are. Uh, but uh, you know the material comes from these digital medias. And I think it's, again, there is like inbuilt question of quantitative versus qualitative. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to beat up on myself right now and uh, just stick to qualitative audience. So you know, it may be a smaller, um, yes, as in I'm, I'm somewhere in, uh, I, I feel I'm, I'm in that uh, you know, first step or second step. Uh, I don't really look up to like, you know, having tons of followers or you know those qualitative, uh, quantitative measures. Uh, so yes, I'm I'm still on that uh, question stage. Yeah, help yourself. I noticed we're losing people, so but I did want to just take the opportunity to say that. I come from an arts background in that I'm an arts administrator and an arts marketer. And I've always felt like a consumer of the arts. And I never really felt like I had a place on the artistic side. And um, I would do a lot of arts promotion on social media. So, um, you know, I, I, I feel like an arts advocate. And so um, more and more I found myself um, curating things, going out, knowing where to find um, great things that are happening, great arts events. And um, you know, I used Twitter as a platform to connect. And then I started an arts blog um, and got connected with a great group of um, Twin Cities Theater bloggers, which is a community, um, a small group of people who are now supporting each other. And um, I wanted to ask you about how um, your interaction with the people that you're connecting with online, has that had, does that spill over into real life? I, I know that um, I tweet, and so I've been live tweeting the event, but um, uh, Andy, or, yeah, I <laughs> see, Art, artfully engaging blog, yes. Um, so, um, uh, Adam, Andy. Um, we had tweeted, and um, so like I, I had, I was following you all on Twitter, and but now we're in the same room, so. I'm more how, on Twitter, I'm sure. How is this? <laughs> I certainly look better. How is Twitter. how is your culture, um, uh, your your culture, um, curating impacted real life? I uh, just speaking for myself. Uh, I live in Madison, Wisconsin. It's not. Uh, it's a great town. It's one of the great American cities, and there's practically no photography there. And uh, the major benefit of doing flag photo has been that it's connected me to a community of people that do photography. And uh, I'm part of something. I, uh, I I'm learning about this thing I care about. I uh, am meeting people that do this thing that I'm extremely passionate about. And 
as it happens, lots of people pass through. And so it, it, one, of the, one of the really cool and unexpected outcomes is that people know that I live there, and lots of times I get to meet people that I've only ever met on the internet. So in a way, uh, the offline community experience for me, and I'll, I'll assume it's the same for you guys, you know, does does regularly come into into the offline experience. It's terrific. Constantly, totally. I mean, I think that's like my goal online is that I mean, we were talking about this before the panel is that our curation kind of strives from our need. It's a very personal, but it's our need to connect. And so I hope, you know, that it's not just going to exist digitally for me. I hope that I'll get to meet some of the people that I'm sharing with, and hopefully it's symbiotic, it's back and forth. Um, I feel like it's successful, kind of going back to like the last question, is that it's really successful for me if I post something online and it leads to another project or something else I get to discover. And my biggest pro like projects are products of that something that hit home with someone, we talk about it in person, I get excited about it in real life, and then I want to take it further in digital space. I kind of see, you know, both sides of that coin and, uh, you know, out of no choice in a way, as in uh, now, uh, in in last few years, my family and my friends and a lot of my professional contacts are online and, you know, people I probably knew you know, over internet, they are now part of my offline <laughs> world. And uh, so I think, you know, is that, you know, that I, I feel that m mirror thing is happening, as in um, there, there are some qualities, you know, that only come out online. And, you know, I know few users, you know, from that lens. Uh, and artists as well, as in they, they make really different work online, as in the, that they share. Uh, but, uh, you know, in their offline lives, they are, they are living very different or kind of passive life. Uh, so I, I observe those, uh, you know, parts of culture as in, uh, but I think there is a fluid exchange between online and offline. And again, I think it comes from, you know, me curating my life. Um, Recently, I stopped playing games, but uh, I probably spent a couple of years just, you know, playing all games on PS4, and I met personalities, you know, that were completely virtual. You know, uh, they could have very, very well been, uh, you know, just like uh, robots. I wouldn't have cared because I knew they were very different in their offline lives. So uh, yes, and then I made a decision, or you know, like, uh, you know, not to do that. Uh, so I think we we. So again, we, we bring this meaning to you know these online and offline you know cultures, and it's part of our decision, you know, part of how we want to look at ourselves. So you know, this is all package of all that. I'll just quickly say, I mean, I agree, it's fluid. Um, one of the things that's interesting to me, I actually like reading about pe um, pe what people are having for, for breakfast online and they won't normally tell me that when I meet them in real life. So there's actually <laughs> a really interesting set of you know, things that I learned through online, and I, I love the quotidian stuff. To me, that's my favorite part about the internet. It's like, yeah, you saw that flower, yeah, you had that for breakfast or whatever. And you don't, it's hard to have that conversation with acquaintances and colleagues in physical space. Any last questions for our panel? All right, with that, um, thanks so much for spending this evening with us, you guys. We went an entire thanks. two hours. Uh, I really appreciate it. We'd love to um, encourage you to grab a survey as you leave and tell us what you think about this evening's program, how much you loved it, and um, how much you loved our panel. <laughs> I didn't give you any bias at all. Thanks so much for coming. Enjoy your evenings. Thank you. Thank you.